Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Ken Baker. It's nice to see you, you all again. Uh, I'm speaking on the platform of the Sun newspaper, so thanks to you guys. And I'm introducing Sean Curran, who's a good friend of mine. Sean Curran is, works in the church in Dublin and for various things. We'll talk to him in a minute. Uh, he's also worked with me in lecturing and presenting theology at the University of Manchester in the area of evangelism. And he would, I think, describe himself as an evangelist. But before that, let's just go back less than 10, 20 years when he was more like a, a veteran criminal <laughs> than, than somebody, you know, kind of changing, changing the way he worked a little bit. Is that a fair assessment, Sean? Veteran criminal? Would you call yourself that? Yeah, that's what he called me. My friend, my friend Trevor, he was, he was actually in custody at the moment for <laughs> a series of gangland murders uh, with the Kinahan Hutch feud that's pretty notorious. He was probably one of the, as we used to say, Johnny, you're a veteran criminal. You were a veteran, you know? Right. I'll tell you that little story, Ken. So i tell you the story about Trevor, Trevor, my friend. I always reached back to the place I came from. We spent a lot of time. We shared prison cells. We shared, we used to do robberies together. We were involved in a lot of crimes up to and including murder. But, uh, yeah, Trevor, I, I, when I got saved, radically saved, I, I used to always come back and they would welcome me, you know, and I used to come down, they have this street in Dublin and the boys call it Balaclava Drive. Balaclava Drive and there's right. houses there are steel windows and bulletproof windows and it's, uh, it's kind of the seat of authority for the drug, the drug gangs. But I remember I came down this day and Trevor was standing on the street corner holding court, you know, and all his boys were running around and Pull up. He's a lovely fella, really. But I uh, pulled up and I started talking. And we're all talking in the window of the car to me. You know the way you see people do it. And then uh, whatever I said, Trevor said, don't start coming around here with your Bible now. And he was joking, you know. So in the moment, and all his boys, all his underlings were all quite close proximity. It was me and him were in conversation though. And I said to him, Trevor, you know my boss is bigger than your boss. Do you not have me to get out on this street corner and start praying that God will do something around this place? Uh, and, and he was like, he stopped and he looked at me. And he said, go on, Johnny, go on. In other words, uh, for me, he, he knew and I knew that the radical power that had changed my life is still in the business of changing lives. But he wasn't in that moment. And all his underlings heard that. And, you know, some of them have come come into the flow of what we're doing, but they're all aware of it. Does that answer your question? It does, it's wonderful. So, so we've got two kind of opposite things. We've got the, the career criminal and somebody who's been brought up with all this kind of stuff all around them and, and somebody who's actually presently on the same streets with, with the message of Christ. That's an amazing transformation, is it? So let's pin you down to to, to the question, what made the difference? What made the difference? What, what, what brought you from one way of life into another? I mean, I know it's going to be a process, but tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, it was, it was instances like that. When I was on the receiving end of someone speaking the gospel, someone uh, speaking their affinity with Christ Jesus, their connection, relationship, what he had done, you know, and not always overtly preachy, preachy, sometimes just sharing yeah. guys that would talk to you about reading the Bible, or in prison. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy sent me a Bible in prison, I still, which I still have today, which I used to read. Guys would talk about the power of Christ intersecting their lives, and you just knew it was true. And you but knew that, it was true? Ah, absolutely. I had a friend, I'll give you another story. So we used to, we were probably 15 or 16, and already we were, we were prolific criminals, you know. And it's not boasting, that's what we did. 24 hours a day, we were involved in crime. We were initiating the drug dealing patterns that you see today in Dublin. The armed robbery patterns, the weapons, the gang culture. We were the sort of initiators on the back of the Republican, you know, because they brought in the weapons. But anyway, so uh, we were in... We were in a local shopping centre, and we were just kids, 15, 16, 
and we're drinking cider and smoking hash and listening to Bob Marley on the Ghetto Blaster surveying our kingdom, you know, the way the, the kids do. And this guy came over and leaned on the wall. We were on the inside of the wall and under the canopy. And he started talking about, and we knew him. He was, he was like someone we looked up to in the crime world. He's just a little year or two older than us. He's a charming fella, lovely guy. Uh, you know, he, he was excellent in everything that we were doing, crime and all that. And the next thing, he became fully enthralled in the life of drugs. Drugs took him over. He became a junkie. Look at him going, boy. Look at the state of him going, boy. He's in bits. My God, look at him. He can't even talk. He's like mumbling and all. And we were like, we could, this was the first, the dark, the first real picture of darkness coming into us right. where people were destroyed by this bondage. Mm. And he was the figurehead for that. But this particular night, he came up and stood on the wall and he was changed. It was like the gathering, you know, where the people, it was frightening that he was back to his senses and in his right mind. And it was like, it was quite astonishing to us. And, um, and then he, he started to say, well, this is what happened. Right. He'd been in this new evangelical church, Holy Spirit church. Someone prayed for him and he was miraculously delivered. And this is how he had come to this state. We knew the power of drugs to put you in bondage. We knew the effect they had on you physically, instantly. But this was the opposite, the opposing power, yeah, releasing yeah. somebody right from the verse. All my friends teased him. Tomo was his name. <coughs> but my ears heard what he said is true. My friend said to him, get out of here, you Bible basher. Keep moving. Well, I stepped back into the shadows under the canopy and I thought, what he said is true. Well, I didn't, right. I didn't verbalize that. I kept it in my heart and I knew. Because if I did, I'd be ridiculed. Mm -hmm. So I thought about that. Instances like that encroached upon my You had that kind heart. of dual narrative the whole time, didn't you? You, ha you had that dual I think everyone picture. does. I, but I, I think suppose, everyone does. I suppose your lifestyle itself was, was addictive in a way, wasn't it? You were stuck in a kind of a, a rut, a, a, way of, a way of living that's very hard to break free from. The narrative is, that's what it is out for the kids. For me, it was, it was money. Get money, get a better motorbike, get a girlfriend on your arm, the nice clothes, and yeah. prestige. And also the fear became part of it. Now, not, not initially, but that you could uh, project this image of power and authority and weapons were all part of that. And that's addictive. Prestige, yeah. pro the pride that goes along with it, the imagery. It's very addictive. It's intoxicating. And did you use the word fear as well? Fear, the addiction. Yeah. What do you mean by no, that? No, no. Well, I mean that, that, that we use fear as a weapon. I mean, if you oh, go into a robbery, you, yeah. you wear a mask, a black. I still do it today, but for different reasons. <laughs> I wear black quite a lot. Uh, you know, it's uh, so, but today it's a no nonsense black. And uh, you know, but uh, so yeah, we used all of those things, and it's quite addictive, it's intoxicating, you know, the prestige of it and the power of it, you know, right? Right, right. So, you had those two things going on in your mind you saw the, the awfulness, the shadow lands of addiction and, and mm -hmm. criminality, but you, yeah. you couldn't really, and you saw the, the opposite view, you saw somebody set free by the power of the gospel really quite early yeah. on. Almost yeah, yeah. in your early stages, uh, you know, we're 15, 16. But uh, when did you, how old were you when you ended up in, in, uh, in prison the, the first time? 16. Uh, they, they came on the, the day before Christmas Eve. Right. And it was, it was a, you know, it's, a, <clears throat> it's like attrition. The police play a war of attrition and you can't blame them because we used to, we used to uh, pillory them and antagonize them. And we were the emblems of, you know, rebellion in our community. And they were quite as, I realize today that the guards, the police were quite as stressed as we were. Mm. Patterns of addiction are really high among the police and the prison service. That was a revelation to me later in the time. But yeah, so they came the day before Christmas Eve, uh, just after my 16th birthday when I was eligible to go to the harder prison. 
They planned it all as a statement, you know, sharp, short, sharp, shock, as Maggie Thatcher used to call it. It's quite, quite sharp, <laughs> quite shocking. Yeah. And uh, so we went in at 16 and from, you know, really quite not, not encountering uh, discipline or authority or being forced to do anything. Okay. The bars, the walls, the time mm. change to prison uniform strip naked, come in and walk in and just call it strip. Yeah. You're like, what, what What did he say? Yeah, strip. yeah. Strip. And you don't know whether it's like, this is like a rape scene from the movie or something, you know, at 15. And then they examine your body for scars and tattoos to identify you. You really become a piece of flesh, meat, identifying marks. And you mm. realize why they're doing this. And so that's why I went to 16 yeah. and continued to go for I don't know many years but I did way over 10 years in prison actually in prison I don't know if I ever told you this but I, I used to work in a, a prison prison for, for a couple of years and you did, you did. And, and I still so I, I, against you <laughs> so I was one of the guards and it always makes me smile when people because I worked in a minimum security prison and it always makes me uh, shake my head when somebody says Oh, these guys got the freedom to watch TV all day. Just, just it's the life of Riley, you know. This easy street. But I've seen, seen people really reduced and crushed in their spirit and in their heart. And also, I've seen seen uh, young people, sixteen year olds, brought into adult prisons because there's no space for them in a yeah. in a juvenile detention yeah. centre. And so I've seen a terrible mix of 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 people, young people. The only people they're going to learn to emulate and enjoy are the older criminals, and 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 so it goes on. So it goes. So I, I could never buy into that story that that prison, even minimum security prison, is easy because as you see how dreadful it is when you can stand in front of a a grown man and and get him to strip naked in a corridor. I saw somebody by the guards left for a joke, left naked in the corridor for a joke. You, you know, to just to belittle him because they, they thought he was getting to, yeah yeah it's a rough ride man it's it's yeah it's terrible and that's what happens again yeah. people become entrenched in their positions not only the criminals but the system the, the guards and, the, and and it becomes a tit for tat that's when it really gets exacerbated human behavior has become i've seen some terrible things and been part of and had that inflicted upon me sure. human behavior it's very very worse and you know what ken uh, I have to say that it's, God turns all things to the good for them that love him in Christ Jesus. Uh, it gives you a heart of compassion for people. It really does. To have experienced difficulties, you know. The story of Joseph was a, jo a story of, uh, you know, imprisonment, sold true. into bondage, taken away captive, experience and all that oppression and cruelty and no voice. And then, you know, to be released and then that gives you a heart to, to see people and not care yeah you know what the world system says or those around you to, to actually listen to the person what they have been through what they've experienced well that's a great story i mean i mean one thing about you and joseph is that joseph wasn't guilty or did you feel guilty <laughs> did you feel i brought this on myself or did you yeah. feel yeah okay all right, yeah. I did, but there were, I knew there was factors that were, you know, I didn't, yeah. me and my dad didn't get on. And, and when I say didn't get on, that's, you know, the scripture says, honor thy father and thy mother. Mm -hmm. And my dad had difficulties too. So there was, there were things that drove me from the house into the to, to hinterland, as you call it, of desolation. Yeah. 